lovely choruses, and we'll have to get into them because they're precious. It's beautiful. to Tuesday night at the Crescent, and do remember that tapes are available afterwards of this series. A brochure is available of all that we have messages taped here through the years. We're now in our fifth year. And also remember that there is a written ministry as well as the recorded ministry that's to the right on the way out, and there is also the recorded ministry on the left at the door. You should have in your hand one of these little leaflets. And on this leaflet, you will notice that there are three blank sheets for those who want to take notes. Please take this little sheet home with you and keep it. There is a wrong spelling on one C, but don't worry about that. We'll spell it right for you when we get to the time. In fact, we'd better do it just now. It's the word precept, P-R-E-C-E-P-T-S. Now, we're going to follow these because they are headings, and for those of you who are listening by tape, welcome. I wish you could see this hungry crowd of people gathered around God's Word on such a really wet, dark evening here in Belfast. And we're hungry, and the Lord has a lot to say to us. Now, I'm going to go beyond what I have put on the sheet tonight, 
In fact, I'm going to go down to verse 30. Hopefully, if I don't make it at the time, that's all right. We'll just leave it whatever verse the time is up. But I'm aiming to get to verse 30 because I want to get to the practical application of our subject, the Christian's righteousness. Matthew 5 and 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophet. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, or empty, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first to be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. You have heard that it was said by them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. Verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophet. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Verses 17 and 18, you'll notice on your notes, is all about Christ and the law. Now keep following the Bible. This is a Bible study that goes on to half past nine and we stick to the text as the Spirit helps us. It is pure Bible study. And if you're not used to it, then listen very carefully to our message because we're trying by God's grace to look at what the text says rather than just my ideas about it. And I want you to go home from this meeting with the truth of this tremendous passage written on your heart forever. And if you're not a Christian, listen carefully. There's a message for you here too. Now, if you've been here at the other evenings, and I always have to be very careful not to do what the famous and popular preacher did in London. Someone said to him, or said to a lady who used to go and hear him a lot, what's he like? Well, it's a bit of a problem with that preacher. What's his problem? Well, when you go to hear him preach, he spends a lot of time telling you what he said last week. And he spends a lot of time telling you what he's going to say next week. And quite honestly, he says very little most of the time. I don't want to be like that. 
But you will notice that from verse 2 down to verse 13 of this, or verse 12 of this particular uh, tremendous uh, sermon, right at the beginning, Jesus has spoken of the Christian's character. He's merciful, he's meek, he hungers and thirsts after righteousness, etc. That's the kind of character he has. Then last week we dealt with the kind of influence a Christian has on society around him. He's like salt and he's like light. But we're not tonight talking about the Christian's character or the Christian's influence. We are talking tonight about how can I be all that, Lord? You say to me, come on, Derek, how can I really, if I know the Lord, be like that? in Northern Ireland, or in the UK, or wherever I am, in my sphere of work, where I live with my family. How can I be like that? Well, the answer to that question, in a word, is, you are to live a righteous life. You and I, if we know the Lord, are to live a life of righteousness. A word for Christian living, another word for it is, Righteous living. And the remainder of the Sermon on the Mount is more or less a, a, a life of righteousness described in all kinds of situations with regard to marriage, with regard to speech, with regard to attitude between fellows and girls, with regard to honesty, with regard to the nitty gritty of everyday living. And there are two great basic principles that we must write on our minds and hearts before we start into the exposition of this passage. Number one, in verses 17 and 18, Jesus is saying that what he's about to teach is in absolute harmony with the Old Testament. And number two, it's an absolute, verses 19 and 20, disharmony with the way the scribes and Pharisees speak it. It's in harmony with the Old Testament, but it's in complete disharmony with the way the scribes and Pharisees handle the Old Testament. So there's a harmony, and there is also great controversy here. You can imagine how the Jews listened, or this very much Jewish um, gospel, Matthew's gospel, written particularly with the Jew in mind, how they reacted to this gospel, and you can imagine very much how that these Jews Disciples reacted. Now, will you please notice how there's a change in the way Jesus talks. At the beginning, say, for example, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's in the third person. Then you'll notice he comes on down to where we have the salt of the earth, and he says, ye, or ye, are the salt of the earth. Comes to the second person. But you notice when we begin our passage for tonight, verse 17, it's not the third or the second, it's the first. I say unto you. I say unto you. Now the Lord Jesus was introduced to the nation of Israel as the great Messiah, as their Savior and as their King. And you know, in any election year, and we're coming up to one very soon, you will notice, especially with all these party conferences, they are filled with promises. Promises. And whenever a president is running for election, or a ruler is running for election, or a political party is running for election, they come out to the electorate and they deluge the country with promises. Promises, promises. Grandiose promises, and the more grandiose they are, the more some people seem to want to vote for them. But when our Lord Jesus came to present himself to his people as king, did he come with promises? like a president does, or a political leader does? Did he promise them an easy way out? No. He certainly did not. Listen to him in verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Oh, when the Jews heard that, they had desperately hoped 
desperately hoped some of them who had stood convicted in the light of the law of God and condemned in the light of the law of God that they would get an easy way to escape from the law of God. And that this new teacher would come up with something which would be an easy way. He'd set aside the law and all its holy and all its perfection that it demanded. And he'd offer a substitute way, an easy way. He didn't. He said, don't you think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets? You see, let me emphasize this evening, and there is so little of it preached these days. God is holy. Angels can look on God, but I couldn't, for I'd be consumed. God is three times holy, according to Isaiah 6. For as the seraphim flew about, they cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of So God revealed his holiness by a wonderful way. Just like taking a mirror to reflect that spotlight on me and how it makes my head shine. A fellow at Scrabble Hall said to me on Sunday night, he patted me in the head, he says, you're shining well, Derek. The things they say to me, I think they're listening to me, you know. But there it is shining down. But if I take a little mirror and I reflect that, then you don't get the full glow of it. You get a reflected spotlight in God's holiness. Blind in its purity. So God brings to the people the mirror of the law. And he says, do you see this law that I'm giving to you? That's all of the laws of Moses and all of the teachings of the Old Testament. This law that I'm giving to you, I'm going to reveal to you my character through my law. And when you look in the law, you'll see how holy I am. Sin is sin, you know, not simply because it injures society or because it, it, it's an individual in society that's hurt by sin or that one committing the sin himself is hurt. Sin is sin because it is unlike the holiness of God. Paul says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What does that mean? We have come short of the glory of God. So the law not only revealed the holiness of God, but it also revealed the demands of a holy God to the people. Listen to the word of God in Leviticus 11. I am the Lord your God, ye shall sanctify yourselves, and ye, that is my people, shall be holy, for I am holy. Listen to the word of God in 1 Peter 1 and 5. Or 115 to the Christians. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. As God is holy, we are called to be holy. Now, you can imagine when our lovely Lord Jesus began to stand up in public and teach the tremendous controversy that raged around the Son of God. You can imagine it. You can hear them. What's this they're asking? What kind of new teaching is this? This man comes out and he stands in front of someone with an, an unclean spirit and he commands the unclean spirit to come out of him. And he comes out. And the people are saying, what does he get out of it? And here he is standing teaching them about various things and they're saying, you know, well now, hang on a minute, they're saying in their minds, what's the relation between the authority of this man from Nazareth and Moses? What's the relation between the two? Now the scribes and authorities, they are uh, scribes and Pharisees, they taught with authority uh, in the sense that they said, our authority is the authority of the Bible, the Torah, the law. That's our authority. Now when people listen to them, as we shall see for reasons I'll deal with later, when people listen to them teaching it, uh, they didn't feel they preached with much authority because Jesus seemed to have a more powerful authority. But they claimed 
that their authority for saying what they were saying was the actual authority that they quoted. The authority was in the quotation. But Jesus was different. Notice when he comes to this tremendous teaching in Matthew 5, he doesn't come saying, now my authority for quoting this is the authority of the Old Testament scriptures alone. He says more. Notice what he says in verse number 18. For verily I say unto you, Notice what he says in verse 20. For I say unto you. Notice what he says in verse 21. You have heard that it was said of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you. You have heard, you have heard, haven't you? Yes, but I say. Notice verse 33 and verse 34. You have heard that it hath been said of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his foot too. Look at verse 38. You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man sue thee at law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Notice verse 43 and verse 44. Ye have heard it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, and bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you. Was he setting himself up as an authority over against the sacred law? The word of God. It seemed to them he was. And hence, they had this either spoken or unspoken question in their minds, if he cannot do away with all that we have heard. Or is he setting himself up as a new authority and doing away with the old authority? And Jesus quickly comes in. Notice it's unequivocal. In verse 17, don't you be thinking now that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, I'm come to fulfill. Now you say to me, what is the law and the prophets? Well, there are three things. Notice your notes. First of all, the law and the prophets is another word for the Old Testament, quite simply. And in the Old Testament, you've got three kinds of teaching. You've got doctrinal teaching. The Jews will call it the Torah, which is the law. That means revealed instruction from God about himself and about man. Doctrinal teaching in the Old Testament. You'll notice that in the teaching of the Old Testament, there is predictive prophecy. It's filled with prophecy about the coming Messiah. Right down through all the prophets, they are talking about the coming one through Isaiah, right through the Old Testament, predictive prophecy. Foretelling, in a word, or foreshadowing Christ in a type. There are, of course, in the Old Testament, ethical precepts. The moral law of God. So there are ethics, there is prophecy, and there's doctrinal teaching. Now Jesus said distinctly in this verse that he hadn't come to abolish it. The word he gave was he come to fulfill it. And what does that mean? Well, there are a whole lot of teachers teach that that means he came to fill it all out, to complete it, to add something to it. Not so. Not so. He had come to fulfill, to carry it out to the very last, tiniest detail. And literally everything that has been said and stated in the law and in the prophets, he gave full obedience to it. Full obedience. And not more than that, he also says that the law and the prophets all culminated in him. And he's the fulfillment of it. You know, that's got to be one of the most stupendous claims that anybody ever made. All of that is culminated in me. And all of that I have fulfilled to the very last detail. What a claim. Did he? Yes, he certainly did. And can I say, just for a moment here on the practical note, here evangelical Christians have their authority for believing the Old Testament scriptures from this teaching. 
Again and again, Jesus quoted from the Old Testament. He believed it to be Scripture. And the question of our attitude to the Old Testament inevitably raises the question of our attitude to the Lord Jesus. You say, how? Well, if you say to me tonight, I don't believe the story of creation. You're going to have to argue with him. You say to me, I, I don't really believe that Abraham was a person, you know. I can argue with the Lord. You see, all that, all that Jewish legislation about what to eat and what not to eat and, and all that that, that, that was a very good leader produced that Moses and company and really they had very good ideas about public health and hygiene, but, uh, well, you're, you're going to be completely contradicting everything our Lord and Savior said about himself because he said that everything that was carried out there in those sacrifices and the not tabernacle and the laver and all the wonderful things that they, the, all that ritual that they went through was all a perfect type of him. Lots of it, even down to a very tent peg. And maybe sometime we'll do the tabernacle here with a model. I'd love to do it sometime. And go through it and have a look at it. And show you that every single detail in it can be linked with a type and a shadow to, of the person of Christ. In fact, you'll notice that Jesus said in verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. You say, what's a jot and a tittle? Well, a jot, you'll notice, I put it down in your notes so that you can know it and remember it. A jot is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's called yod. It's almost as small as a comma. And it's made with a single stroke. That's a jot. And a tittle is where you have two characters in the Hebrew lettering which are almost virtually the same. Almost the same. But one differs from the other only because it bends slightly to the left. It is a letter which differs from a similar character by a slight projection to the left. And every single jot and every single tittle of the law, Jesus said, will be fulfilled. And we believe there's some, uh, especially in the prophetic sphere, uh, that is taught in the Old Testament that is yet to be fulfilled. And it will all be fulfilled. In fact, Jesus said in verse 18, till heaven and earth pass. Because you know that this earth is going to pass one day and we're going to get a new earth. And the immediate heavens above us are going to pass and we're going to get a new heaven. What a day that will be. New heavens and new earth. But this earth and this heaven won't pass until every jot and every tittle of the Old Testament and all it taught will be fulfilled. Lots of it has been fulfilled perfectly in Christ. In fact, it's all been fulfilled in Christ. And in his future program, it's yet to be fulfilled. But in him, it is perfectly fulfilled. Now, of course, at the moment, you have fellows going around teaching the new morality. And the new morality says the only thing that really is absolute is love. And all that is taught in the Bible with regard to the moral law of God, ethical law of God, doesn't really matter. You just love each other. That is the only absolute law. Well, it's not so. The word of God doesn't teach that. Jesus said so. I was interested to read that the Reader's Digest uh, are bringing out a new Bible. In fact, it's called... Uh, it's called the Reader's Digest Bible. Just imagine. But the Reader's Digest Bible has been cut by 40%. In fact, it is 320,000 words shorter than the text of the RSC. 40% shorter. The Old Testament has been cut by half, and the New Testament cut by a fourth. And uh, the editor, uh, a man called... Metzer, says that he hopes that once people have been lured into his 60% 60, 60 rendition of the Bible, a sizable proportion who have never cracked the cover of a Bible will go on to read the whole thing. And he's got a lot more hair than I have. How's I see him here? You see, people aren't really reading the Bible, says this uh, great editor at the Reader's Digest. People aren't really reading the Bible these days. They never crack the cover of it. And if we cut it all down, then it'll be, you know, it'll be okay. And Oral Roberts and Pat Bowie says it's an authentic Bible feast. And Norman Vincent Peay says it's tremendous. And somebody who's an executive director of the American Association of Bible Colleges and president of this and God knows what else. 
An important new addition to the life of Christians in the church and the world, these fellows are all saying. Well, they're free to their own opinion, but they're wrong. I always feel like a preacher I used to hear, you know, and he used to say, I've read 30 commentaries on this verse, and every one of them are wrong. Now, here's what I think. And I'm sure these men have, uh, have thought about this, but I think they're severely, severely out of, out of court. Severely out of court. Now let's take this reader's guide to this Bible. Let's take a verse like, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Well, you just get the first bit. The heart is deceitful above all things. Let's take a lovely verse like he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Well, you see, they're cutting it down. You see, the Bible is really verbose. You see, they'll cut it down. Just, you just got he was wounded for our transgressions. And the Digest Bible leaves the reader with no idea what is missing uh, if he hasn't read the Bible before. Now, I was very interested in this uh, particular this particular review of this book, it wasn't written, as I see, by uh, a committed Christian. You know that whenever I read this to you. So I'm not reading it from the point of view of someone who's a committed Christian. This is what he says. So far, only cranky fundamentalists seem to be offended. I wonder who they are, folks. They argue that Christians must take the Bible straight, as God gave it. Warns the Christian deacon, the reader's digest has done a good job for Satan. A bit much to be sure, says this writer. So I don't agree with him. But even the digesters must have entertained the thought that not everybody was going to be pleased. Why else would they have dropped some of the climatic words from the last book in the Bible, Revelation? The passage they dropped from their digest Bible says that it threatens eternal damnation if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy. They leave that wee verse out. You see what I mean? The word of God is so powerful that it cannot be broken. And if anybody breaks it, they will have the word of God and eternal damnation upon them. Let's say quickly repent. And we're not cranky fundamentalists. We may look like them, but we're not. We are standing behind the precious, wonderful, perfect, match left son of the living God, the head of the church, who said, not one God or not one fiddle shall pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. Why do they do these things to the Bible is beyond me. So it's very real, isn't it? Your attitude to the Old Testament will very much show your attitude to the Lord Jesus. Not how did the Lord fulfill the law? How did he fulfill it? Could you look at a wee verse, please, in Galatians 4 and 4? I'm always remembering there are people in these meetings who have never been through some of these passages before. That's what this meeting is for. Galatians, Ephesians. Galatians 4, verse 4. Now here's a verse some of you have may, may have never come across before. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, wonderful, made of a woman, made under the law. You know what's this? Under the law? Was he not above it? Oh, indeed, in the very real sense that he was, he is, remember, he is the holiness itself. The law is but a reflection to show us what his holiness is. But here, deliberately, according to the precious word of God, the Lord Jesus made himself come down to earth. He was, rather, he was made of a woman and deliberately put himself under the law. 
You see him dying, and he put himself under the law. And I tell you, he never failed in one single point. First, he's described, thought he did, but he never did. Do you know the controversies about how they gave off about his disciples plucking ears of corn on a Sabbath, and how he healed on the Sabbath, and how the Lord Jesus taught regarding the Sabbath, etc.? And the word of God is absolutely clear that the Lord Jesus fulfilled the law as he lived under it. Perfectly. They couldn't fault them. Although they desperately tried. These are great truths and they fill my heart with joy and every Christian's heart with joy. To the minutest detail, even Pilate had to say, I find no fault in this man. Of course, they said that he had broken the law of the scribes and Pharisees because he had blasphemed and claimed to be God. But he was God, so he wasn't breaking the law. Praise the Lord. But not only did he fulfill the law by his perfect life, but oh, praise God this evening, by his death. By his death. You see, there are some people, and they are merely sentimental about the cross, and they say the cross, and the awfulness of the cross. But they are merely sentimental like the women of Jerusalem weeping. And Jesus told them to stop. Didn't realize what it was about. We too weep and we are touched by the pathos and cruelty of the cross. But the cross is the Christian's glory and the Christian's song. We glory in the cross of Christ in this assembly. It is our greatest boast. It is our message to this province and to the world. It is the message for Ireland. It is the message for this generation. The cross. The cross. The bloodstained cross. The cross of Christ I see. Inscribed upon the cross I see in shining letters. God is love. The cross. God forbid that I should glory in, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the law of God demanded that sin be atoned for by death. So the animal sacrifices came, and the little lambs turned their necks in innocence to the man who plunged in the night. Like my friend Bill Russell of Scott Street puts it so well near Porta Dine, he says, Derek, I was in the abattoir the other day, he said, and I stood there and I was moved as I watched it. A lovely, innocent little lamb was brought in. As I saw it turn its little neck innocently to the executioner as he killed it. That's why that lovely image is used of the Son of God. Behold, said John the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God. Sin. But when he died upon that cross, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, we are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And friend, if you're not trusting in that for salvation, you perish. Here you're looking into my face. Where is your faith resting this night, my listener? On tip, wherever you are, in prison, in hospital, in your car, sitting in your home, or sitting here in this beautiful building. I say to you, from the depths of my heart, where does your faith rest? Is it in the cross work of Christ for salvation? I was a guilty sinner, but Jesus died for me. Say amen. Say amen. Good. The folk on the table think you're not here, you see. I got a letter from India the other day from a girl in South India. She said, it's the silentest or something like that uh, congregation I've ever heard in my life. Because the mics weren't picking you up. You see. That's why I get you to say that. Because they are listening and they know you're with me. Uh, unless they're trying to imagine them up here all on the own. Oh, amen. The wonderful work of Christ. What a, what a precious thing it is. And by his death, the Lord Jesus fulfilled the law because the law demanded that a sacrifice be made. And he was the sinless sacrifice. And we don't need animal sacrifices anymore. And in his flesh, he abolished in its place, that ceremonial law. So we don't teach the ceremonial law that you have to keep it. Because according to, to Ephesians, we read that Christ abolished it in its flesh. And by his death, that ceremony was passed and finished. Wonderful. Very difficult thing for our finite minds to grasp, but it's true. By his life, he fulfilled the law. And by his death, he fulfilled it. 
He met his ultimate demand. And all the doctrinal teaching, as you have in your notes there, one A, the doctrinal teaching, he fulfilled that. The doctrine was speaking of him. The predictive prophecy, he fulfilled that. And the ethical precepts, he fulfilled that. By his life and by his death. Oh, but what is the Christian's attitude to the law? That's the difficult question. What's the Christian's attitude? Now, this can get very complicated, and I'm not going to go into it in a complicated way. I want to get to the heart of this. Try and get the spirit of it. Let's not get bogged down in any theological jargon. Let's stick by the word. The scripture foreseeing, very clearly, um, that these people, let's go back to Matthew 5, that these people would question the authority of the Lord Jesus. The scripture uh, shows us that the Lord Jesus actually said, here on earth, I haven't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. And whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And you say, do I have to teach all the dietary rules and regulations of the Old Testament? Did I not eat bacon, etc.? Well, as I said, Ephesians says, by abolishing in his flesh that law. And very complicated, but let me just get it as simply as I can. Jesus set the whole ceremonial aside. His flesh, a reference to physical death, because in the cross he fulfilled all the types and shadows of the Old Testament ceremonial system. And Paul is probably making a secondary reference to the moral. Jesus did not abolish the law as a standard of behavior. It is still in force and binding on a following. But he did abolish it as a way of salvation. And Jesus abolished the regulations of the ceremonial law and the condemnation of the moral law. Both were divisive and both, both were put aside by the cross. And this is what the council at Jerusalem and the Acts of the Apostles agreed about this whole question, about should you be circumcised, etc. And Christians were saying, Christian Jews, unless you're circumcised, you're not really a Christian. He abolished that. Let's go to the verse, will we? It's important that, that you learn it. Ephesians 2, rather, and verse uh, 15. Let's not just... Uh, try and get away from the problem, but let's state it simply with not getting bogged down. Ephesians 2, 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Well, you notice the important line there is, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So it's very, very clear that in Matthew 5, when Jesus said he hadn't come to abolish but to fulfill, in Matthew, Jesus is teaching the difference between Pharisaic righteousness and Christian righteousness, which involved a deep and radical obedience to the law. Paul's reference is to the ceremonial rather than the moral. So the moral still applies to us and we teach it. The ceremonial he abolished in his flesh. And it's not a discrepancy. It's a very clear doctrine. And we'll see... The meaning of this in Matthew 5. You say, I don't understand that. Well, hang on a minute. Let's see it work out in the passage. Let's go back to Matthew 5 and verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we have Christ's attitude to the law. He didn't come to do away with it. He fulfilled it. And in fulfilling it, the ceremonial is done away with. So you don't need it anymore because he's concerned it. But here we are in this situation where Jesus is saying, now you who are Christians, you who are my disciples, what should your attitude to the law be? Your attitude should be totally different than the scribes and Pharisees' attitude to the law, the moral law of God. And I find this absolutely it's fantastic. It, it really breaks me. There's not an area of your life that isn't touched by this Sermon on the Mount. Pharisaism. Let's talk about it for a minute. You know, it was a very, very subtle kind of system that learned to try and get around the law to suit themselves. They knew the revelation of the holiness of God was in the law. They knew that, but they tried to get around it. They devised a system which essentially got around the requirements of the law to make it possible for men to attain to Another set of standards, their interpretation. The Pharisees said that if one lived up to their interpretation of the law, then of course you'd be acceptable to God. Do you know that the Pharisees codified the scriptures? 
They codified the scriptures into 365 negative commandments and 250 positive ones. So if you kept the 365 negative ones and you kept the 250 positive ones, you'd make it to heaven, brother. You'd be all right. You were acceptable in God's sight. But every one of the commandments they had set before men had to do, that is, the two, 365 negative and the 250 positive that they had codified, every single one of them had to do with external obedience to God's law. Let's talk about it for a minute. You know, it was a very, very subtle kind of system that learned to try and get around the law to suit themselves. They knew the revelation of the holiness of God was in the law. They knew that, but they tried to get around it. They devised a system which essentially got around the requirements of the law to make it possible for men to attain to another set of standards, their interpretation. The Pharisees said that if one lived up to their interpretation of the law, then of course you'd be acceptable to God. Do you know that the Pharisees codified the scriptures? They codified the scriptures into 365 negative commandments and 250 positive ones. So if you kept the 365 negative ones and you kept the 250 positive ones, you'd make it to heaven, brother. You'd be all right. You were acceptable in God's sight. But every one of the commandments they had set before men had to do, that is, the two, 365 negative and the 250 positive that they had codified, every single one of them had to do with external obedience to God's law. They interpreted the law of God to apply only to the outward act and never to the thoughts to produce the act. They said it was wrong to commit murder. Sure, it was wrong to commit murder. But they didn't say anything about the hate that produces the murder. They said it's wrong for a man to commit adultery, but they didn't say anything about the lust that brings the adultery about. They said it was wrong to steal, but they said nothing about the covetousness that leads a man to steal. And as long as a man was not caught in the act, right? the man was Come in a dolphin in his heart didn't matter. As long as he hadn't done it, did it? It's all out with. Must have been with. And that falls far short of the standards of God's holy. And the whole nation groaned under these Pharisees and scribes and their traditions that they had built up. They groaned under it. And they were incapable of measuring up to it. Of course they were. And they looked for somebody to liberate them. And Jesus said, But I haven't come to abolish that. I've come to fulfill it. I want you to think about this because this really touched me very deeply this week in a circumstance that I came across and I asked the gentleman I was involved with if I'd be allowed to quote him in public. And he said, of course you can. Mark 7, please. Mark 7 and verse 7. I never want you to forget this, Peter. And may I never forget it. Hard be it, said Jesus in verse 6, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Hey, what's that? For doctrine? The commandments of men. There was a certain gentleman who was here now not all that long ago and he made a rule for those who was over in the Lord as an overseer. He made a rule you weren't allowed any dogs in the house. So all the Christians on earth instance didn't have any dogs. Why? Because it said, little children keep yourself from idols. You don't have any dogs in the house. I've got a cat, but he said dog. And you would be a man. You would be a man. The people who believed him. And because his interpretation of the law was that after 12 years of age, you were at a responsible age, and if you were children who weren't saved by the age of 12, you weren't allowed to eat with them anymore. And some people commit a suicide. that. Teaching, said Jesus, and we have it in a modern form, I can tell you all over the place. Teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. He said that that verse, that will kill and keep yourself from idols, means you don't have dogs, so I don't have a dog. No. With all the tenderness in my heart, I say. A very real thing, and I'm going to get closer to the knuckle in a minute. 
Verse 8 and verse 9, For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things as ye do. And he said unto them, Fool, well ye reject the commandments of God, that you may keep your own tradition. Their tradition, their ideas of what God really said become more important than what God says. And I have heard it. People say in Ireland, I'm of this brother and I'm of that and I follow that preacher. But so-and-so said. No, but so-and-so said. What does the word say? I'm not of Paul. I'm not of Apollos. I'm of Christ. I learn this. And it will save you. Heartbreak. For I have cried myself to sleep over them at times. Don't you do it. Don't. You accept the traditions of men as the commandment of God. If the tradition doesn't measure up to the commandment of God, you'd better be very careful. Some traditions that people have are good, but not all of them are. It is a tradition in Ulster that on Sunday afternoons, families go for a walk. At least it is in ours, and they walk me off my feet. And we have our Ulster Sunday. And families go out. That is a tradition. But you'll not find it in the word of God that thou shalt take thy family for a walk down Shaw's Bridge every Sunday afternoon, will you? Let's be careful. Let's be careful how we apply it. According to the law of Moses, when a father or a mother was aged and infirm and unable to support himself, it was the responsibility of the children to support the parents. Not with the God giving responsibility. And it would cost money to support the parents. And the Pharisees who loved money didn't want to contribute to the support of the parents according to their needs, even though the law said they were obligated to. So what did they do? They devised a way around it. Notice what it says in verse 10. For Moses said, Honor, this is Jesus talking, Honor thy father and thy mother. And whoso curseth father or mother, let him die to death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, A gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered. And many such things do you. You say, I don't understand it. Well, listen. You've got to look after your parents. Now, the law also says that if I take something and I devote it to the Lord, a pot or an instrument uh, or something to the service in the tabernacle, when it's outlived its usefulness, by the way, I'll have a drink at this time. When it's outlived its usefulness, it can't be brought back home in you. You take that into the temple and use it for well, the priest to drink water out of. Not that I'm a priest of that kind. But if you take that into the temple and set it down, say, for some little service in the Lord's work regarding the tabernacle, and then it outlived the people, they're not allowed to bring it back home because it was devoted to God. That's what the law said. It had to be destroyed after it outlived its usefulness. Don't worry, Sam. I'm going to put it back down. But the Pharisees devised a formula. You wouldn't believe it. They devised a formula where they pronounced the word korban. Now, korban means a gift, consecrated to God. So they'd say, everything in my house is God. Korban means it's all dedicated to the Lord. So uh, they had no right to use it themselves. Now, here comes a knock on the door one day. Imagine this. Comes a knock on the door one day, and here's a, a young son standing, and his dad's coming for help. And he realized he was going to have to part with some of the things that he loved in the house, uh, particularly money. And when his dad came to the door, he knew his dad, maybe as we say, uh, wasn't, uh, was on the dole, or unemployed, or whatever it was in those days. And here he'd arrive at the door, and he had no money, he was destitute. And just as the young fellow seen his old dad coming up the garden path, as you like, Goes along, and as he goes to the door, oh, here comes Dad. He just say to the whole house, Corban. Got it? All devoted to the Lord. So he had actually said it, although he hadn't said it until he saw his Dad come. Corban. 
Don't think he was thinking that. So he's got it right. Son? Our father comes and the fellow says, Father, ever so sweetly, what can I do for you? Uh, well, you see, son, your mother and I are destitute and have nothing to eat or to buy food and we're coming to ask you to fulfill your filial responsibility to us according to the law of God. And you can see the crocodile tears going, Oh, father, you've just arrived half a minute to you. What do you mean? Oh, well, I've just devoted everything I have to God. I've just said Corban over the whole house. Uh, and you know what the law says, Dad? Don't you? Yeah, you know what the law says? I'm not to take it back from God, what I have devoted to Him, until it outlives its usefulness, and then I destroy it. And it hasn't outlived its usefulness yet, Father. And the Father would depart with his needs on that. That's what that has to mean. From verse 11, down to verse 13. You say, that's wicked. Yeah, that's Phariseeism. And it's still around. A friend of mine, last week, was called by his father to take everything that he had from his childhood and take it out of the house and get out and put him on the street. Why? Because he had fallen in love with a Christian girl who didn't worship at the particular evangelical church he worshipped at on that circle. You see me? And he came to my house at about two in the morning. And I asked him if I could say this in public. I said, because I want to lay it upon hearts. I want it to be real. He said, Derek, I came down, down the stairs of my home, he said. And there was the very things I had made. I had made him see. The very things I had made him see. And he said, there they were. A little stool and other things I had made as a child or as a young teenager at school. And the father just set them at the bottom of the stairs so they wouldn't miss them. Didn't happen in Ireland, it happened somewhere else I'd say about. Bring the staff relief. And yet no staff relief. You know what Dad said to him? Said to him as he was throwing him out of the house. I'm doing this for truth, you know. I'm doing this for truth. And I have to comfort that guy. I have to pray. And I have to save him from breaking his heart. Why is it that there are still Pharisees around? It so happens that this girl is going to join that particular group of churches that that gentleman belongs to. But it wasn't soon enough. Just because his son was going and involved with her. And the Lord nearly did it. Is there one of you listening to my tape tonight? God forgive you, sir. Or madam. If you are building the traditions of men and not the commands of God. And I tell you, we're going to have to get away from it. If we're going to have revival in Ulster, it's what's holding it up. And before I go too far in talking about this, or rather too long in talking about this rather than too far, let me just apply it to myself. I see a Christian go to the flicks. Pictures. Oh, go to the flicks. And I go home and sit down on TV and watch something far away. I'm not sorry. I do that. I'm not sorry. I'm afraid. Well, I'm down the law for somebody else. They'll say, oh, well, it's in that building, you see. And it's wrong in that building. But it's all right in my head. There's nothing comes closer to the heart of the evangelical church than this. And accept your righteousness. Exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. God's word. Accept my righteousness. Exceed it. And the elder of this assembly, who looked me straight in the eye one night on a country road in a bus, and laid on my heart his burden for these passages of scripture, and asked me to think about them, and I thought about them, and then dismissed them for a little while, and they chased me all over the United States, and everywhere where I was in the summer. And I can see that elder, whom I love in the Lord, 
tenderly looking into my eyes, said, Derek, what about those lovely verses and challenging verses? Accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. That is what Ulster needs. Right. He was in the will of God, and I got up here the first night to start expanding these passages, and my school teacher out of the crowd came out, and she looked me straight in the eye. She said, Brother, I think she's here tonight. Brother, I have been praying for a long time. She said, When you got up to do it, I knew it was of the Lord. I believe this is God's message for this province, and for my heart, and for yours. Brethren and sisters, in the presence of a holy God tonight, are we like the scribes and Pharisees, full of tradition, outward ex Eternal obedience to the laws of God. And our hearts are far from them. For, said Jesus, let me apply it very quickly. And let me quote something else before I do apply it. A neighbor was passing my garden one day, and she stopped, and I knew right away that it was gossip and not flowers she had on her mind. And this is what I heard her say. That girl then speaks. She returns from our midst. She drinks and she talks quite a lot. She knows not to speak to my child nor to me. My neighbor smiled, and I thought, hmm, my tongue can accuse and carry bad news, the seeds of this trust that can sow. Unless you've made no mistakes in your life, be careful of the stones that you throw. Then a car speeded by, and the screaming of brakes, and a sound that made my heart grow still, for my neighbor's one child had been pulled from the path and saved. Bad girl. The child was unhurt, and my neighbor cried out, Oh, who is that brave girl? So sweet. And I covered the crushed, broken body and said, That's a bad girl who lives down the street. I live down the street. And Jesus takes it, and he starts applying. You say, well, how can I have righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees? You need to be born again to have that. My righteousness tonight is not my own, it's Christ. I'm hidden in him. And if you're saved, you're hidden in him. And your righteousness is not your own, it's the Lord. It's his righteousness. He is us. And through his power, living out through us, we can lead a righteous life. And it's got to be not so much, not so much more and more obedience to God's law, but deeper and deeper obedience to God's law. So deep that it touches, touches what? Back to Matthew 5. Devastating, I'm telling you. Matthew 5. Jesus said, well, thou shalt not kill. So the Pharisees would interpret that. That simply means murder. Jesus said, you're in danger of judgment. If you murder, that's what the law says. But that law, thou shalt not kill, there's something just as bad as going out and second a knife in somebody. And you say, what's that? To say and stand in front of your brother and be angry without a reason. You say, the Pharisees say, you commit a murder, you'd be guilty of the judgment of God. If you stand before your brother in Christ or in the flesh and you're angry with him and you haven't got a cause for it, a reason for it, that's as bad as murder. Huh? Oh, yeah. Because it's anger that leads to murder. It's anger that causes people to kill people. And Jesus said, you see these Pharisees, they've got an outward external obedience of the law, but I want you to follow me. I want you to love me and follow my law in your heart. And get right to the source of it. And if you turn around and you say to your brother, you're empty, raka. You're in danger of the council. Now, I know there are all kinds of interpretations of what raka means. And people try to get around it, you know. They say, well, the typical English word of that is nitwit. Or blockhead. Or numbskull. Or the Belfast word is bonehead. And all kinds of crazy, fanciful things are said. That's not what it means if you call someone a blockhead or a bonehead or a nitwit. That you're in danger of the council. Well, actually, raka means contempt for a man's head. Yes. Contempt. Utter contempt for his mind. And then the next word is, if you say to him, fool, you'll be in danger of hell fire. That's not just contempt for his head. That's contempt for his heart and for his character. You're a fool. You're a scoundrel. That's what you said. You what? You call people. Because if you do it without a cause, 
And you shall say to your brother, with utter contempt for his mind, you're not to have utter contempt for his whole mind, nor utter contempt for his whole heart and character. You're to love him. And if you say those things, look what Jesus said, you are in great danger of hellfire. Danger of it. If you've done it, repent of it. And the blood of Christ can cleanse you. Okay, you're going on to a meeting one day. Let's put it in modern language. And you're standing in a service. You're bringing your gift to the elders, you like. And suddenly you're standing there singing and worshipping. And you remember that your brother has ought against you. Well, get out of the service and leave it. Leave it. Go on the way home. And see the man that you have something wrong with. And get it right. And then come back to the service. It's true. And I tell this, and I'll be criticized for it. They'll say that fellow thinks he's a great fellow. But I have ever been honest with you. The very last night, Victoria Hall, were down in May Street in their... In the old building, before we moved here, there were some army soldiers uh, guarding the place, and we had to go through a checkpoint all the time coming to the meeting. Old Victoria Hall members will remember that. And I'd come to take the very last service after 60 years of witness down there, up to the last one there and the first one here. And a soldier was kind of offhand with me, and I was very offhand. He, he held me up, and, and, and I, I didn't curse at him or anything, but I was stupid. Something. <laughs> and I thought, well, he deserved that. He'd have been nicer to me and the preacher, you know, or something like that. And I got in the car, and I went into the car park, and I was climbing up the steps, up the wee back steps of the old hall. I remember it so well. And God said to me, Sam, um, you are a hypocrite. Get back down there and apologize to that. I said, no, Lord. Well, you're not going to preach my word with power until you... Well, Lord, I'll, and, I, and I remember going up the stairs and down the stairs, and I said to my friend who was with me, Granville, I said, come on, Granville, let's go. Why did I feel small? And I went round to that soldier, I said, sir, I'm really very, very sorry, and I really meant it. I said, I am sorry. I was off hand and cheeky with you. Will you forgive me? And he smiled and fucking you, he it. And boy, did we have a good meeting that night. You see what I mean? It applies to me as much as you. The Almighty one night, after preaching to a great congregation, was standing at the top of a flight of stairs, and he standing at the top of a flight of stairs, and the man came out to him, and he called him for everything. This man called Moody for everything. And he took him, and he took him down the stairs, and broke his leg to boot. He said, couldn't happen. It did happen. And Moody had to get up in front of 3,000 people, and admit what he was. Have you something against your brother? Then go and get it right. There's an awful rush out of here tonight, Yes. You know what I mean? That's the word of God. See how it's applied? They keep the outward. And Jesus said, pick the inward. And if you're going to court, then pay your debt before you get to court. If the boy's taking you to court for debt, if you can pay it, you pay it quickly, lest you be in, cast into prison. And then in verse 27 and 28, he said, you've heard about adultery, haven't you? What about adultery? Sure you have. I shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already with her in his heart. They said, oh, it's just a physical act. Jesus said, no, it's not. It's the heart thought about it. It's just as bad as the act. Remember Jimmy, Jimmy Carter got into tremendous trouble, do you remember, when he admitted that he had looked to lust and admitted it. He was honest. And they called him for everything. You know, it's an amazing passage. Fellas, how do you deal with lust? How do you deal with it? If to look on a woman to lust after her is as bad as the physical act of adultery, how are you not going to deal with it? When every hoarding cries out to us. When every magazine you lift has it waiting at you from the corner. When every product of, of any worth across industry is sold on inflaming lust, you must make a covenant with your eyes, lad. Tell us, an older brother, and preacher in church. Job said he kept a covenant with his eyes. He made a covenant with his eyes! And the control of the heart is due to the control of the eyes. See? You know, girls, it would be very wrong for me to stand here in this pulpit tonight and let the plate about fashion. But girls, it's one thing, to make, one thing to make yourself attractive. And it's another thing to make yourself deliberately seductive. You girls know the difference. 
And I can tell you, so do we men. And verse 29 and 30 has caused me a lot of heartache. If your eye offends, you cut it out. Then if your right hand offends, you cut it off. Better to have one left than to go to hell. What does it mean? Does it mean we're all to go and name ourselves? Of course it doesn't. Metaphorical language. If your eye, my brother, causes you to sin, then don't look. Be as if you're blind. He said it's impossible I'd crash the car. He said it's absolutely impossible. Well, you know what I'm talking about. You can live somewhere else, can't you? I'm talking about a real thing. If your eye offends you, then be as if that I were blind. Turn it away as if you don't see. I have to do that every day. And you have to do it every day. You're going to have to do it. And if your foot causes you to sin, my brother or sister, don't go. As if you haven't got a leg. And if your hand causes you to sin, don't do it. We must guard the approaches of sin in our lives. They do it at the Falklands, didn't they? Put out sentries. You get the sentries out in your life. The moral sentries. To warn you of the approaching enemy. And I can tell you that the church of Jesus Christ is absolutely rich with it. And fellows can't get up in public to pray because their minds and hearts are filled with sin. And girls can't witness. And fellows aren't giving their lives to the service of the Lord as they should be because they're allowing their eye and their hand and their foot to offend. Jesus said, cut it off. Oh, what? Are we to be so foolish as to allow the enemy to overwhelm us simply because we have posted no sentries to warn us of his approach? And it'll require naming. Sure it will. Cultural naming. You'll have to stop reading that, certainly. You'll have to stop reading it. And you'll not have to go and see that certain film. And you'll not have to visit that certain equity. And you know very well that those things are there which will cause you to sin. And you'll have to be culturally named. Did you not see the new song? Did you not see the French lieutenant woman? Did you not see it? No. Why? Well, because I'm a fellow and I, I could blue blood in the game. And I'm healthy. I know what it would be to me. Why? Have you not read that new novel? About the take a stop. Have you not read Freddy for science and you know? No. Why? Because there are descriptions in there of things. And I only have to look at the cover anyway to know what's inside. What I love about Tolstoy and the great men, when they write about adultery, they would so frighten you after the consequences of it without enslaving you and teaching God's law in their story that you wouldn't touch it for a thousand million miles and more. And they don't even have to open a bedroom door. A great writer wish I could write like that. And I taught English. I know what I'm talking about. have to preserve your purity of mind and you have to say no. I want a soft drink, please. Oh, come on. Come on. The insane even among Christians, it's the insane. Come on. You don't have to go out at night like I have to go out at night. And hold fellows down on bed we are Christians. We have got a cause. Yes, that's what I love that. One of the loveliest Christians I know came one night to this service and he wept. He said, if only I could talk to those young people about my social drinking and where it led me to wreck my Christian life. And he sat and wept. He 
can all be easily solved with the word no. Like my English teacher used to say, and I remember him saying it in class, and he didn't seem to be any of his jokes. When I go to these days, I want to get that thought for that. You got to look to insist. A lot of other things to do. Oh, take a little wine for thy stomach, sis, you say. Some boys have partial bad stomach. And that soft like giant dime, it's like soft like dime, the attraction of lust, isn't it? Yes. But when they're all sitting gossiping around you, maybe this is my greatest sin. For I say, yes, he's a good man and she's a good woman, but... You know, you always hear them, oh, oh, when they're building somebody up, you know the but's coming soon. I know these teachings run counter to the permissive society, and I know people will call me a square, but I have learned them. I have learned them. I have learned them from the Word of God and seen the results of them. And these teachings, and those who obey them are blessed. It's based on the principle that eternity is more important than, than, than culture. And purity is more important than being thought culturally clever. And purity is power. And we have to decide quite simply in God's presence tonight. Christian, you're going to live for this world, or you're going to live for the next. Are you going to follow the crowd, or are you going to follow Jesus Christ? That was it. It's been quite a night, Lord. We have been through quite a week, Lord, with many examples of these things even in our own personal experience. We think of that poor Christian lad who was thrown out of his own house. We pray for his God tonight. We love him for the Lord's sake. We pray you'll melt his heart and he'll touch himself on. We think of others, Lord, who have given in to lust and given in to criticism of others and their, their free-ranging tongues and calling people empty-headed and stupid and fools. And they don't realize that in God's sight, it's as bad as murder. Oh God, I have so often been like a Pharisee regarding thy law. I've got my own way around it, Lord. Lord, write thy law upon my heart and upon the, the flesh of my heart. On the flesh of my heart. And not just something that is a list of rules but that gets into my mind and gets into my mood until I'm pure in thy sight and truly living for the Lord. Cleanse me, cleanse us all. Thank you for watching this video. Feel free to like this video and subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with new videos as they come online.